We are live. Hello, everybody. Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening from wherever you're tuning in. Thank you for uh, checking in our channel, Raising Multilinguals Live. My name is Tetsu Young, I'm giving you a warm spring welcome. <laughs> this is, it, it is officially past March 21st, but it's, it doesn't feel so much like spring yet. Snow is still out there, but it is three degrees out here just outside of Montreal. And how is it over there, Uta? Here, it's much warmer than over where you live. Uh, hello, everyone. My name is uh, Ute limacher Ribot from Ute's International Lounge. And uh, I'm very pleased and honored to have Sabine Little as our guest today. Dr. Sabine Little has been our guest also in 2021 and shared with us how parents and children can collaborate in home language maintenance. We will share the link in the description. Sabine is lecturer in the languages education at the University of Sheffield. And in her research, she focuses on links between multilingualism, identity and belonging. And today we will, she will tell us more about biliterate or multiliterate development, which is difficult when not supported by education and often <clears> left <throat> to the home environment. Like she says in one of her articles, I will share the link later on in the comments. But before diving into the topic, Sabina, please tell us more about what made you focus on research on literacy in multilinguals. Sure. So, as you said at the beginning in your very nice introduction, thank you, is that I focus on multilingualism, identity and belonging. So, actually, my research touches on everything and anything that is related to that. And I did a study about eight or nine years ago where I was focusing on amongst other things, what parents of multilingual children are hoping or dreaming that their children might achieve multilingually. And I split that up across um, spoken language, written language, reading, so across all four skills, listening, speaking, reading, writing, ranging from, oh, just being able to hold a basic conversation to you know, as balanced bilingual as possible. I'll come back to that um, <laughs> later on. And what I found out of that is that parents were much more confident in supporting the spoken language and they felt much less sure about how they might support literacy development. Now, personally, I love reading. Um, as we talked about the previous time you, you kindly asked me to visit, I also have a multilingual child myself. So it was a kind of dual experience as a mother and as a researcher because the, the children that I was working with as well as seeing it in my own son multiliteracy development or literacy development across all the relevant languages can be linked not in all children but in some children to identity that efficacy feeling the feeling of I can do this in one language <clears throat> but I can't do it in another language was impacting on their sense of identity and as such it then firmly became embedded in my overall interest of multilingualism identity and belonging yes so it's a it's a much broader vision that you are now embracing mm -hmm. in all your studies so and I'm very grateful that you are embracing also the literacy part, uh, like I told you before, and maybe we are going to talk about this in a moment, but can you maybe uh, explain uh, us about the difference between biliteracy and multiliteracy and uh, uh, asynchronous multiliteracy? And what is asynchronous multiliteracy? Maybe you can explain to those who don't know it yet. Yeah, I'm going to come back to to this notion of when I said the balanced bilingual earlier and everyone in the room wrinkled their nose a little bit. Um, so about 20, 30 years ago, there was this idea that if you are bilingual, you are fully equally competent across all languages. And thankfully, more recently, we've understood multilingualism or bilingualism as a bit of a sliding scale and biliteracy is exactly the same. Again, I'm not going to go into too much depth of talking about literacy going beyond reading and writing, because of course there is also oracy, there's understanding of language, there's narrative, all of that is part of literacy. And I might dip in and out of that. Um, but for ease of, of this session, I will focus largely on the reading and writing um, of the language development. So biliteracy, just like bilingualism, isn't necessarily a balanced affair. I've lived in the UK for about 30 years. I came here to study at university. I was born in Germany. And 
I would consider myself to be highly competent in both languages. But if I suddenly have to do something like communicate with an insurance company in Germany or something like that, that's something I never had to do in German mm -hmm. until very recently. Um, and that is a register that I just don't have experience of. So I know all the individual words, but more passively rather than actively. So biliteracy, even in highly competent multilingual people, isn't necessarily, it's not necessarily about the words, but it's also about the register, for mm -hmm. example. And asynchronous biliteracy development is essentially the development of this. So when I think about biliteracy, I think about a moment in time. When I think about asynchronous biliteracy, I think about the development, how children develop their literacy across their multiple languages. And as you can imagine, in most multilingual children's life experiences, mm -hmm. there is a certain <clears throat> pressure to perform in the school language. So when school starts, there is support to learn to read and write in one particular language. And in that language, they also get assessed in, um, in their reading and writing. Whereas in the home language, it is often up to the parents or the Saturday School Heritage Language School to develop these skills, which means that there's often very uneven experiences on the child's part on how they encounter their languages in a written format mm -hmm. so often they yeah they have the increased support um but if they develop asynchronously so one stronger at the other i can use my own son as an example when he was nine years old he read a book he had a reading age school was telling him of about 12 or 13 in english mm -hmm. um and he read books at that level and in german he read books aimed at six-year-olds because actually nine was roughly the age when he was starting to pick up reading in German. He picked it up a little bit earlier. So you can imagine that for him it was much more fun reading in one language, in his stronger language, than in the other language. So we had to do a bit of work to make sure that this gap wasn't getting wider and wider but was hopefully narrowing um, to give him the opportunity to enjoy reading in all his languages because if you enjoy something you do it more often and then by definition you improve doing it yes but uh i had exactly the same kind of situation with my children as well also with german actually and uh, also this discrepancy between uh, the the their proficiency in reading in the school language and the home language became a problem exactly for that and i think it's very important what you say to to uh, encourage parents to yes, help their children maintain this interest and the motivation to improve their skills, although it might be demotivating because you see maybe one book is, is with a lot of pictures and the other one is already mm -hmm. without pictures, right? I, I remember that you had a presentation somewhere uh, where you, you uh, showed the two yeah. different uh, pictures of the two books that your son was reading when he was nine years old. And uh, in an article that I'm going to share in a moment, you said also that books remain the favorite heritage language resource among multilingual families, especially if they live abroad and there is no, not this multilingual village around you. So that is the only resource very often. Um, I think in the article that you, you wrote, it was, uh, is there an app for it? You mm -hmm. said that, I think. Uh, what are now the effective strategies to motivate now children to read in their home languages? What, what would you suggest? Well, I think it's it's I'm really glad that you drew on this this paper and this this comment um, because it's actually parents that favoured books the most. Mm -hmm. And I think that is because when we think about reading with a child, it's not just reading. It's a very holistic experience. It involves cuddles, it involves pointing, it involves, involves conversation, etc. And in the study, is there an app for it? I was comparing how parents were engaging with their children with the books versus apps and games and this holistic experience of tying cuddles and closeness to reading was much more prevalent 
in the, the book system. But when I talk to children, they actually liked all sorts of, of reading materials. So they would read via games. So in terms of strategies, um, I think it depends a little bit on the age of a child. <clears throat> With a young, a young child will come onto your lap and you'll read together at some point. Um, they might not enjoy that anymore. So what we did in our home was what we call you read yours, I read mine. Mm -hmm. So my son, we would both lie on the bed in the evening and I would read my book and he would read his book. Um, and it was a very non-threatening environment because he was just getting on with it. I wasn't intruding in his in his reading experience, but at, every now and then he could ask me a word and it wouldn't mm -hmm. disrupt his reading experience because he could just check and I would just tell him and he could carry on enjoying his book. And in that way, I was able to scaffold his reading mm -hmm. and enable him to read something at a higher language level than he would have been able to had he been completely independent. Mm -hmm. um, and other ideas actually come from the children that I've worked with. So um, listening to the audiobook while you're reading a, a paper copy of the book or an electronic copy of the book, for example, is, stat is a strategy that one right. of the children in my research used. Um, synchronous reading, so either reading the whole book in one language first and then the other language, um, or even reading it chapter for chapter, so that you have a chance of, and either, I've seen it both, I've seen children who prefer reading it in the language they feel less confident in first, and then in their more confident language to be sure they understood everything, but mm -hmm. also vice versa to sort of get, you know, understand the plot and what's going mm -hmm. on and then rereading it in the language you're not quite confident in. And also, as I started in the answer to this question, I wouldn't disregard gaming. Um, so my own son at some point was using a German word that I had no idea how he'd picked it up. And when I asked him, it turned out that several months previously, he had switched the language in his Pokemon game to German. So he was actually doing an immense amount of reading in German um, without my knowledge. And I only found out when he used this highly technical term. And I said, where, where does that come from? Which, as you say, if you grow up or if, if you live in a bit of a language isolation like like we do we don't have a strong german speaking community around us so there was a limited number of ways this word could have entered his vocabulary normally it was, was via me um so it was a lovely surprise to see words entering his vocabulary completely externally to to my input so i think it depends a bit on working with the the child's interest and i would argue that any work that happens with the child should focus on removing barriers to enjoyment. Um, so what we want, what I want to achieve certainly is to make sure that the child is happy to engage with the language so that they will do so voluntarily. Because once that, once that is, you know, once that bridge is crossed, everything becomes a lot easier. So a lot mm -hmm. of my work focuses on working with the children and trying to identify what works for them to mm -hmm. remove the barriers to enjoyment and then take it from there. Mm -hmm. Yes, absolutely. You you were just uh, mentioning one strategy that is known maybe to the educators uh, who are following, who, who know this as a scaffolding, right? Mm -hmm. um, and it can be maybe in, in this next context of the next question that we have, can you maybe explain how this transfer of literacy skills can look like or would ideally look like? You, you mentioned that uh, if your son was uh, not understanding a certain word, you could just chime in and, and explain to him and maybe uh, tell him what this means so that he had um, an idea in what other contexts it can be, it can be used. But are there other ways yeah there is actually there's a comment here in the chat that i can see by achim yes. um with no expertise in this at all i would think that it makes a huge difference whether the several languages a multilingual person speaks share the same alphabet mm -hmm. um and yes absolutely that's that's what i want to talk about a little bit because i think the approach does depend on how closely linked the two languages are and i would argue that they both come with advantages and disadvantages. Obviously, if if both languages or however many languages are involved share the same script or the same alphabet, that is one less 
element the child has to learn in order to become literate. Um, but at the same time, it can be a bit confusing when different letters or different constellations of letters follow different rules in the different languages. Now, English is a bit of an odd one out here because English has got so many weird pronunciation rules anyway, um, that you kind of learn English and what you see on the page isn't necessarily what you get orally anyway. So children are already doing a bit of work around how different letter combinations may make different sounds. But it can still be really confusing if, for example, um, a W in, in English will be a W and in German it will be a V. So um, that, that makes it a little bit more tricky. At the same time, if the scripts are totally different, that confusion is less likely to happen. But obviously it's a completely different script it's a completely different set of rules and then there are also considerations for example i've i've worked with with chinese families and if you type in chinese you can type in pinyin so in in the phonetic alphabet um and it will show you the character and that is how i can write chinese but if you ask me to write the characters themselves i i would not be able to do that at all so am i literate or illiterate when it comes to writing in chinese mm -hmm. you know so so there's different interpretations as well but i think what is really important regardless of the script is an understanding of how language works and when I work with families or when I give talks, I often say that we spend a long time talking in the language to children, but we don't necessarily spend a lot of time talking about the language to children. And I mean that both from an emotional perspective, what the language might mean to somebody, but in this context, I mean mainly understand, if you understand what a verb is, then you can understand how a verb might work differently across the different languages. If you understand what a tense is, then you can understand how tenses are, are different. If you understand, you know, a, a because a via clause in German and a verb, then you can say, oh, after via, the verb will always go to the end of the sentence. So you can make those discussions around language if you have a basic understanding of, of how language works. Um, so without knowing necessarily what the two languages are, I think um, the transfer of literacy skills works best if there is a basic understanding of, of how language works in the first place and equipping children with that knowledge. Mm -hmm. So independently of, of uh, how different the scripts are. Mm. Mm -hmm. well, I, I, think, I think Sabina's point is that it's actually the other way, right? It, oh, the other it's way. closer, then there's more commonalities, there's more overlap that you can work on. Whereas if it's a completely different script, you have, you, including different syntax and whatnot, it, it could get messy and, and more difficult for the transfer. That's, think, that's my assumption of what you were saying. I think it's about the understanding of differences. So for example, again, when I, I, I do use Chinese because I have a basic understanding of Chinese because yeah. There are quite a few. So, for example, saying, oh, actually, that language doesn't have definite or indefinite articles. Mm -hmm. You know, there's no there's no. Uh. Um, mm -hmm. And that's really important to understand, you know, and how not only how the language works orally. And typically mm -hmm. we have a, a sort of oral understanding before we try to read it. Mm -hmm. so that will be something that the child will understand. You know, you can say, oh, the and a. Uh, you know, we, we don't have that in Mandarin. So look on the page, you won't find any character for the and uh, but instead you might find, um, you know, a classifier or, you know, like some or small or things like that. So mm -hmm. there are ways to integrate language knowledge, linguistic understanding into transferability of, of literacy skills. Yes, and I think uh, we touched here a very important point because we assumed now from what we were talking that uh, we are talking about languages that the children 
are quite proficient in already mm -hmm. when they start reading. Whereas if uh, they, they were starting to, to read in a language that they are just at the beginning of learning it, it's, it's a complete other situation because they need to find out first the, the different patterns, like you said, if there is a definite mm -hmm. not, uh, indefinite uh, article or if there, there are certain verbs uh, where the verb position is or the different um, objects in the phrase. So if there is no basic knowledge or very poor basic knowledge in the language where the child needs to learn or is supposed to learn how to read, then it's, it's even more asynchronous, I think. Yes, absolutely. Right? It's, it's even bigger the gap uh, between the two. Now, I, I would like to, to concentrate now or to focus on, on the study that you did. Mm -hmm. uh, you have analyzed the reading habits of uh, seven children aged 8 to 13 across multilingual families in England over 10 to 12 calendar months, which is a, a great period. I, I cannot imagine how much data you had. <laughs> it probably took you several years. No, I'm, I'm kidding. <laughs> which gives uh, actually a very important insight into how uh, older multilingual children reading habits and attitudes look like. Uh, you also used, uh, I think it's Cliff Hodges' Rivers of Reading. Mm -hmm. And I would like to know what you found out. So how can the Rivers of Reading help multilingual families in discussing multilingual reading? And what is Rivers of Reading? I mean, the, yeah, maybe with, right. yes, with, with that name, we can have an idea, but please. Uh, yeah. yeah, I was going to start with a sort of brief introduction of what it is in the yeah. first place. So the Rivers of Reading is is a methodology but what that means in reality is that children are invited to create an artifact and I say artifact which sounds grand but I tend to leave it up to the children what that might look like and I've had long pieces of paper I've had um, bits of wallpaper painted as a river um, I've had a PowerPoint presentation from a child so for me it's quite important that the children get to choose what their preferred way of showing their reading is. So the way a river of reading works is that children are invited to think chronologically, hence the river. So you start at, at birth, at the source, and you follow inviting the children to share what they think were important reading experiences or reading resources. Um, I, I, I always shy away from just saying books because mm -hmm. actually in my research, somebody was reading um, the racing, um, the, the, the horse racing announcements with their mm -hmm. grandparents. And, and that was important because it was part of bonding. So children are invited to consider the important things throughout their life that they have read. Most of them are books, but not all of them. Um, and especially in multilingual families, I try and get the, the children and the families to focus on which books were in which languages and why they were important. And it is important that it's important books and not just favorite books. Because when we go for favorite books, we tend to go for books, for example, that we found fairly easy to read. If it's something that you really struggle with, it's it, it possibly not one of your favorite books. It could be. But if it's important, it can be important for lots of reasons. And one of the things that the study found was that multilingual children have much more complex reasons for putting books, or I'm going to say books just for shortage, but I mean all reading resources. Otherwise, I'm going to tie myself in knots yep. as I talk. Mm -hmm. um, so multilingual children have many more diverse reasons for including books in their river of reading. So rather than just favorite books, they would include books that were the first book that they managed to read independently in one of their languages or a book that physically accompanied them on their migration journey or a book um, in the Rivers of Reading um, article. There's one girl who is talking about a book about brownies. Um, so the, the guides, mm -hmm. um, the, the UK version of guides. And she read that book when she first moved to the UK. And then she proudly finished that bit of the interview by saying, I think it's two years later, I joined the Brownies. Mm -hmm. So they had the, the multilingual children included the books for many more 
complex reasons and the paper goes into that a little bit mm -hmm. and what I like about the rivers of reading is because it starts as early as memory can can make it it can't be done in isolation so it needs really detailed communication with parents because parents are the ones who are going to remember oh you asked me to read that to you every <laughs> single night do you remember for months on end it had to be that book um, <laughs> And they can help with that story. You can, they can they can remember. Oh, that's the one that Auntie So and So gave you. Um, so the parents are really important in filling in the gaps in the memory, mm -hmm. um, and that means that it's a fantastic opportunity for families to discuss reading experiences. And I think that is important from three perspectives. On the one hand, as I mentioned, for for family cohesion i think mm -hmm. quite often again we read with children um or if it's the school context the child reads to us and we write it in the reading diary mm -hmm. but we don't often i think maybe some people who are listening do but i think in general we don't often talk about reading experiences and why a book was important or not important so i think it's important for that it's really important for the children because pretty much every child I have worked with on a river of reading was surprised by how much they had read in their heritage or home language. It was always more than they thought. And that always gave them that sense of, oh, I'm better at this than I thought I was. So again, it upped their, their self-efficacy, their belief, I can do that, which ultimately, mm -hmm. in many cases, changed the perception of reading and made them more willing to engage with reading in the heritage language. And I also think it's super important for schools as a way to explore what goes on in the home. So I've worked with multiple schools who set the river of reading activity as a homework and then used that as an opportunity of really understanding literacy development in the home. You can often see how um, there is a stronger engagement with multilingual books at a younger age. And then when school starts and independent learning, the books in the home language often tend to sort of dribble off a mm -hmm. little bit because of the asynchronous literacy development and yeah. children become less confident or they don't want to engage with the books that they consider a bit babyish, maybe if they're not as strong in the home language. And so for the schools, it's a fantastic opportunity to A, value the reading in the home mm -hmm. language, but also to to encourage children maybe to to keep going in the home language. And the river reading is obviously because it's um, it's chronological. It's something that can be repeated several times. It can be added to, um, and as such, it's a great artifact for children to add to as they grow older, and and take active charge of shaping their their literacy lives. Really. Mm -hmm. I was just wondering before before we get any deeper into this the the outcomes of the study, how how were the families chosen uh, that you you studied? I think these are eight to thirteen year olds, but they're multilingual families. Was, was it just a, a poll that you did, or or is this specifically selected for certain criteria, uh, for including age? their yeah their so reading? yeah so they volunteered and there was a call. Um, there was a call on a mailing list. There was a call on multiple Facebook parenting groups. Um, mm -hmm. And it was the age range that I was interested in because I wanted to work with children who had had a, a track record of literacy experiences, so yep. to speak. Um, for this particular study, because it was the first one that, that, I, that, as far as I know, had been done with multilingual children, I did say that it would be beneficial if they had some connection to reading. So if, you know, if if, if I had children who right from the start said, I hate reading, I don't do any reading. Mm -hmm. So because I wanted to understand their reading experiences, mm -hmm. I did look for children who, they didn't have to read in all their languages, mm -hmm. but they did have to consider reading part of the activities that they would do. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But beyond that, um, it, I, I did accept everybody who volunteered who fit the parameters. Um, mm -hmm. And so there were multiple languages and multiple scripts also involved in mm -hmm. among those children. And and I think uh, that 
all were, were in the UK, right? They were yes, living in right. the UK, so that uh, their their school language or the education uh, the language of their education was English. Yeah. And so you had. Uh, so perhaps you could tell us a little bit about uh, the languages that were covered of these uh, from these uh, families. I believe yeah. the Chinese was one of them. Yeah, yeah off the top of my head, <laughs> Uta's got yeah. it ready there. Um, I so. <laughs> There was um, there was Slovak, um, there was Polish, there it's was very different Dutch. From, from English. There was yeah, there was mm -hmm. Dutch. Um... It's a little closer. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> wait 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 wait. There was uh, was there also he he Hebrew? Hebrew? Yeah. Hebrew? Yeah. And... Oh, it's very representative. Can't find it. It's very nice. I had it, it before. I can't find it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It was. It was really. It was really fairly well. It was fairly widespread because, yeah, I was I was lucky. I was hoping that I would get um, children who would speak multiple languages from multiply different um, areas, but also including different scripts. So, mm -hmm. yeah. So, yeah. As I was listening, the reason why I was trying to get to the uh, the, the sampling is that I was wondering if somewhere in our discussion we. I'm sure the audience also there, there's probably some audience in there going, oh, my kid hates reading. How do I get them mm. to read? And if your sampling was is, is already on kids who have uh, 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 an, an inclination towards reading, then that, that might not be a, an outcome that you're looking for in, the, in your studies. Yeah, I think I've since done the River of Reading in lots of different mm -hmm. contexts. Um, the study itself, the one that got published, was obviously it was it was a proof of concept. I essentially yeah. wanted to understand: Do multilingual children have different reading experiences to monolingual children? Again, from the from the perspective of identity and belonging, I wanted to see what kinds of attachments they had to the things that they were reading across their multiple languages um and yeah the, the finding was that yes they did so again part of my part of taking that forward then is trying to help children identify these attachments mm -hmm. um so that if they don't currently Have enjoy yeah. reading mm -hmm. then is there a way of yeah. making those connections again rather than um focusing mm -hmm. on the reading and the output instead focus on um i've done a lot of work on motivation and um, so it's yeah. essentially it's about encouraging the motivation rather than the reading because if you encourage the motivation the mm -hmm. reading will take care of itself yes oh wow yeah. it's music to my ears <laughs> <laughs> yes absolutely uh so i have shared i, I found other passages. thank you i just found it as well <laughs> thank you yes I'm perfectly aware when when someone does a study afterwards, you you you, you did so many that after a while it all just mixes up together. So it's Hebrew, Slovak, Polish, Spanish, Hungarian, and Dutch. Yeah. So they are are quite uh, different from that. I would like to share um, a comment question from a Facebook user. You mentioned that after doing the River of Reading, children realized that they actually read in their home languages more than they thought. But you also said that in many families, the older the children got the least they read in their home languages. Do you think that going through this experience encouraged children to read again more in their home language so that the rivers of reading were encouraging and motivating them? This activity a fantastic motivating. question. Yes. Yeah, absolutely it did. And I don't want to I don't want to homogenize all multilingual children. Um, but in the study, um, there was one, I'm not going to say the name because I can't remember the pseudonym that I gave him. So there was the, the, the Hebrew speaking boy um, actually had a really negative attitude towards Hebrew um, at the beginning. And through the river of reading, he was starting to talk. He said, oh, actually this book, um, I read for the plot, not, not to practice my Hebrew, but this book I read for the plot. And that was one of the books that he included as being important. And of course, you can imagine if you if you're used to only reading books to improve your language skills, that might be experienced as quite a bit of, sort of drudgery. But mm -hmm. and then by the end of the study, this child had uh, begun to read to his younger sister. 
in Hebrew. And I thought that was fantastic because it was it was not threatening. The language level for his younger sister was much lower. So mm -hmm. he didn't have to negotiate the complexities of the language that he didn't feel mm -hmm. quite confident in. Mm -hmm. But he kind of picked it up his literacy development again alongside his younger sister. So by reading to her, he'd found a real purpose for mm -hmm. his reading, which made him more motivated. And like I said, it, it was non-threatening. The language level was something he could cope with easily. So he could focus on the on the plot and the enjoyment rather than on the grammar or, or mm. the, the vocabulary. And so if, um, I've not followed up with him since then, but if he now grows with his sister apace, then that is absolutely fine. I mean, you know, there's, there's about three years between them or something like that. So actually by now, the studies from 2019, you know, by now he, he'll, yeah. you know. So yeah. again, it, I think it's about the experience to come back to, to the question of talking about reading and having it taken seriously and especially in school. So mm -hmm. if a school says, I want to know what you are reading um, in schools, um, we talked about this just now before we before we opened up to the audience, but quite often children edit their identities in a school context and they kind of feel that their home language identity isn't necessarily welcome. Um, I sometimes give a talk where in fact there is a talk where, where I talk about um, the rivers of reading in more detail, but um, I've, I've worked with children and trying to gauge their reading in their multilingual or in their, in their multiple languages. And I talked to them for about 20 minutes and none of them were telling me about their reading in their home languages. And after about 20 minutes, um, this was a school focus group. I said, but I, I, your teacher identified you as somebody who was reading in their home language. And my favorite, heartbreaking, but favorite quotes of, of all my research is an eight year old girl who said, yeah, I've read all the Harry Potter books in Bengali, but why do you want to know about that? Nobody wants to know about that. Mm -hmm. So this eight-year-old girl had decided that because I was a, an authority figure in a school context, even though I asked poignant question, <laughs> pointed questions about her multilingual reading, um, that I couldn't possibly want to know about oh, yeah. her home language. So, and again, that study, that's that's now that study is now nine years ago. So mm -hmm. we have come on a long way since then but the rivers of reading are a fantastic opportunity for schools to say no we do want to know we really want to know and then give um i don't like the word ammunition but give give tools to yes. carry on those conversations about multiliteracies in a school context and showing that the home languages are welcome yes and especially also what you just mentioned before this this uh, experience with this boy that he he uh, through this reading to his younger sister or let's say also through sharing what children can read in their home language it, it really enhances their their self efficacy yeah. and also the the identity yes. as as a reader in the target language or in the heritage language that's a very powerful uh, tool i must say it's an uh, amazing anecdote. I, mean, I, I, I love it. It's so, so representative of the stuff that Uta and I, we, we talk about a lot. It's yes. not the hard skills of the languages. It's yeah. often what's surrounding it and that supports and lifts it up. And, and, and I think the, the same Facebook user put up a, a comment mm -hmm. here. Thank you very much. I love that you did not focus on the ability per se, but the motivation, motivation and the purpose it gave the children. It's, it's, it's exactly that. <laughs> yes. Thank you so much, Facebook user. Shout out, by the way, to everybody who's uh, watching everyone, right now yes. on, on YouTube and on Facebook. And on Facebook, we have the Facebook page. We have the okay. our new Facebook group. So uh, uh, if we don't see the, the person's name, it's often uh, somebody who's watching through the group, uh, which requires you to actually check a, a box to, to allow your identity to be revealed. But still. Anyway, thank you for a shout out to everybody watching right now. Yes. So I would like to, to stay now in the in the context of education of schools, etc. Mm -hmm. Because uh, and you mentioned also the translanguaging practices uh, in schools that are based on very often the assumption exactly that the pupils are able to read and write in the home languages, something that I observed many years ago and where I saw that there is a little bit of gap 
but maybe mm -hmm. <laughs> by now it's closing or closed already. Mm -hmm. uh, but we know uh, for a fact that for many this is not the case. So what would you suggest teachers who are adopting translanguaging practices to make sure the pupils don't feel mm -hmm. inadequate, uh, not enough, not, not proficient mm -hmm. enough, uh, etc.? I love that question. And, and I thought a lot about it because I think not all teachers are necessarily confident in encouraging translanguaging practices in the classroom in the first place mm -hmm. and i do a lot of work with teachers focusing on how you don't have to be a linguist in order to support multiple languages you don't have to speak all the languages in your classroom in order to support multilingual children but it can be tricky if you try your best and then you know hey, let's do this and then chuckle i can't write in that language <laughs> and you kind of feel you've made this effort and you've hit a wall. So thank you for asking the question. I think for me, it's about, again, it's it's less about focusing on ability and more about focusing on, I'm going to call it focusing on an environment where it's okay to know just a little bit. So we're not after perfection. We're after creating opportunities for children to use however much of their languages they are able to bring to the table at that particular moment in time. So as an example, if a child is asked to label the human body, head, hands, arms, whatever, um, some children would be able to do that better in English than in the home language. Some people, new arrivals, might be happier doing that in the home language than in English. Some might know some words only in one of their languages, but not necessarily the same language, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Sometimes we know um, like a child's word, like tummy rather than belly or stomach, for example. So telling children, asking children, inviting children to do these activities across all their languages, however they see fit. Mm -hmm. creates an opportunity to then go back to that and say, OK, I can see you know this in your home language, but not in English. Let's look it up together. Let's plug that gap. Um, you know this one in English, but not in your home language. Have a chat with your parents. Can they fill in that gap? So mm -hmm. the teacher would not be expected to correct the home language. It's more about creating an environment where children are able to, to share. And again, we get this picture of their language and literacy development across their multiple languages. Um, I've got on, on my project, the, the Multilingualism in Schools project, there is a similar activity um, on labelling a, a mini beast. Mm -hmm. um, and there is an example there of a child who labelled a ladybird in, I think, oh gosh, I might get this wrong now, English, Macedonian and Cantonese. Mm -hmm. And then just for fun, um, he used a dictionary to look up the French words because French was his school language and he wanted to impress the French teacher. Okay. So again, it's one of those scenarios where um, once you open the door to, yeah. to motivation, this child went beyond and said, actually, I'm gonna, I'm gonna add another language. I'm gonna learn, I'm gonna, I'm gonna build on this. And yeah. this came from valuing the languages that he already had. And the parent had to give some help with the yes. with the Cantonese and the Macedonian. Um, so, yeah, I think as children's confidence grows, so will their literacy skills. Translanguaging obviously isn't just about being able to to use the language in an output, but also being able to use the language in a process. So it might be that a language isn't used in say, in note format, where the spelling doesn't really matter. You know, you just try and think things through in one language, but you produce it in English, say, or you might write your notes in a mix of languages. So again, it's about creating an environment where children learn, because you have to learn how to draw on your full linguistic repertoire, how to use all your languages for learning in a curriculum, in a school context where where children are not encouraged or in some cases forbidden to use their home languages for learning. 
we, we're ultimately asking them to learn with one hand tied behind the back. So, so the translanguaging, transliterate practices okay. help them to, to develop holistically their learning experience. It might not necessarily um, help them with their spelling in Hungarian or you know, because the teacher can't do it. But again, it can it can create bridges between home and school for the teacher to help the parents understand where it might be useful to to discuss things in Hungarian, um, to make sure that there is understanding or to write things down, etc. So it's an, again, it's a great opportunity to build these homeschool relationships. Yes, and and I think uh, what you mentioned before with the scaffolding, right? When you were uh, reading with your son, it goes both way, uh, both ways, and that's maybe the the important focus here. That it's uh, that translanguaging in school is one thing, and the scaffold or the scaffolding in school and the scaffolding in at home, and you can actually do also the translanguaging at home. So yes. you can uh, adopt both uh, strategies if you wish uh, in at home with as parents in all kind of settings, not only with regards to literacy, but with uh, with just fostering the home. Uh, languages or family languages and the same uh, at school. Thank you very much for explaining this more in detail. And I would like to add that uh, the, the person who was commenting before is Yoshito. Thank you, Yoshito, <laughs> for, <laughs> for letting us know so we can give a name to uh, to you. Um, yes, so I think it's, it's very important in, in all of this that the children also feel valued for the, the languages that they speak. Um, what I wanted also to ask, because I think you had in, in this group of children or families that you were uh, analyzing for your study, there were also some who were moving internationally mm -hmm. or, or, or maybe not, I don't know, but uh, they were in transition, so to say. Yeah. And uh, this is also something that can affect uh, the use of the home languages in many multilingual families. If there is anything that that changes in the environment, in the setting, in the in the everyday life, uh, with regards to the language use, uh, what did you observe, or what what uh, were their reactions with regards to their literacy? How could they keep up with, for example, reading in their home languages, although they were maybe moving somewhere else? It was really different across the family. So, for example, the, the Dutch boy in the study, he had uh, he was born in the Netherlands, but then at some point moved to South America um, for a couple of years, I think, and then moved on to to the UK. And in this particular family, they had um, a family rule. Part of the family language policy was that they would now let me get this straight. They would not read books in the language of the country that they were in. I think I've got that yeah. right. Yes. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so so while they were in, in South America, um, or Mexico, were they Mexico? So yeah, yeah, Central America, they um, they would read books in English and in Dutch. Um, and then when they first moved to the UK, they, they would read books in Dutch and in Spanish. But of course, due to school, they, they, mm. there's also a need to read some books in English, but they would focus on the, the respective other languages to support that. Um, and one child was a new arrival. She had recently arrived from Spain. Um, so for her, it was actually English that she was originally less confident in, but mm -hmm. then um, she, I think she'd arrived four years prior to me meeting her. Mm -hmm. um, and so she was just at the stage because of the age that she was at, I think she was about seven when she arrived in the UK. And I think I talked to her when she was 11, I might be about a year out. Um, but you can imagine she came to the UK age seven. So much of her literacy experience was then taking place in the English school system. And she was just on the cusp of her English reading overtaking her Spanish reading. And the family were just starting to be concerned to make sure that they maintained both languages, um, that the Spanish wouldn't get lost. Yes, because I, I know that many families then worry that this this uh, change of uh, community environment, school language, um, provokes a shift in the whole mm -hmm. language use and then that the children will, uh, I wouldn't say forget, but actually not use their home languages yeah. uh, anymore. 
and then lead maybe even to yes, not not responding in the language, not not only not reading anymore in that language, but also not responding. But what you said uh, before, with schools being more and more inclusive and more and more supporting multilingualism, also in the classroom, that we hope that this will not happen too too many times in the future. But still, I think it's very very important for parents and educators to be aware of what is possible in order to, to really support these children. And also with regards to their identity, right? We didn't speak mm. uh, a lot about, uh, talk a lot about identity today, but it's all omnipresent in everything that we could <laughs> say. So, yes. So do we have any questions or, or comments now? So, and... Mm, no, I think it's good. It's good? Yep. So maybe I can ask you the, the last question, uh, at least mm. for, for today, or maybe I, I come up with another one. What further aspects are you going to focus on in your research? So we, yes, please let us know. <laughs> yeah, I think, as I said right at the start, anything that's linked to multilingualism, identity and belonging is, mm -hmm. is my bag, is my interest. Mm -hmm. So that does mean that I do some research with families and I do some research in the school context. Um, but I think um, when we spoke last, we, we talked about um, some of the work that I have done with my own son. And we had that study that got published that we authored, my son and I together. So um, we had this, this co-researched project that was his idea. I blame him completely. Um, <laughs> but it does mean that I, I am very, very interested in my research um, going forward, not exclusively, but wherever I can to make sure that children have a say, not just as the researched, but as co-researchers. So um, I have just finished a study that didn't actually involve multilingualism. Um, it was about critical digital literacy. So a completely different, well, a slightly different approach, um, where we worked with young co-researchers aged eight to 11. Um, and I'm just about to begin a project working together with a group of young Chinese heritage language speakers where I am asking them to help me develop the questions that I should be asking when I talk to children about growing up multilingual. So I'm getting more and more interested in working with young people themselves as co-researchers. There mm -hmm. is this, this adage, this saying, no research about us without us. Um, and that is becoming more and more, um, not relevant, but more, but it's, it, it's not as often done with really young children. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. I'm, I'm hoping to, do more work in that area um, because I think, yeah, it, what, if I found one thing in my research, then it's it's the fact that there's no such thing as a typical multilingual child. Mm -hmm. So I think working with a group of multilingual children is probably my best bet on yeah. making sure that I ask the right questions. That's absolutely fascinating. I, can I get back to being a child and being <laughs> <laughs> I, I would love to. No, I find it really, uh, yes, empowering what you're doing uh, to ask those the research is about usually mm -hmm. so that it comes somehow bottom up yeah so so that mm -hmm. their their kind of uh, perspective also their experience uh, how they experience the different languages or not um is taken into consideration and actually also highlighted and uh what what i also very much appreciate that you focus on older multilinguals as well so not mm -hmm. only the, the first four six years but mm. really then when when children are very conscious about their use of languages their preferences they can also name it they can realize it thanks to these uh, activities mm. like, like the rivers of reading uh, and others but this uh, talking in a metalinguistic way mm. about what is happening to you i i personally only did it when i was adult already because mm -hmm. Being multilingual was very normal, but then I realized it's not that normal. It's not the norm for everyone. So that kind of perspective, I think when children have this from early on, they are much more conscious about their, their choices and their their way also to to develop their identity in the end. Again, we are back to identity. Yeah. We have to have another mm -hmm. discussion about that. <laughs> <laughs> yes. It's absolutely fascinating. Um, 
it, it, it was totally eye-opening for me, listening to this link between literacy and identity. I, I mean, it, it, it's normal if you think about it, but I don't know, I just never really thought about it this way. It, 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 it's always been mostly oral uh, communication that, that was a stronger link to identity mm -hmm. in my mind. Uh, maybe because I'm, I'm one of those kids who grew up not really liking reading. <laughs> I think I wasn't a, I'm not a very good reader. I still am not. Um, just don't enjoy it as much. Uh, I have four kids. Uh, my oldest doesn't like reading quite as much. Mm -hmm. I, I think he, he gets that from me. But the other kids, uh, they, they bring the books to me and they want me to read uh, to them. So I'm, I'm glad, you know, I didn't pass on the, that, that, that part <laughs> <to> them. <laughs> but, but yes, this, this link between identity and, and literacy. I definitely hope uh, you'll dig in much more uh, and, and reveal more secrets for us. Uh, <laughs> Happily. <laughs> it's, uh, it's absolutely been uh, eye-opening for me, uh, this, this session. So thank you so much. Thank you. Yes. Thank you, yes. And what I also find interesting in these rivers of reading, because you mentioned that children were doing them with the parents, and then the parents remember, you know, before the children remember themselves, what kind of books they were reading. And then you go down that memory lane, but you go also down memory lane on your own readings that you had as a parent. And what I found interesting was to see how they can overlap with the ones of our children, not because we ask them to read the books, but they mm. pick them themselves. I saw this with my children. I was always surprised when they would pick a book that I picked at the same age or around the same age. Mm. Said, what made you choose this? It's just interesting that we never talked about that. But then you have this kind of uh, synchronicity, asynchronicity, asynchronicity somehow. That's, I uh, think if, if as a parent you love reading, I don't I, I'm, I'm not going to speak for all parents but I think there is a there is an intimacy you want your child to read the books that you really enjoyed because you want them you know if, if you've been really touched by a book as a child mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You, you kind of want to pass that on to your own child you want them to share that experience mm -hmm. um and if that book I have got I have got that case. Well, in fact, I have found an English translation, but I've not told my son. Um, there is there is a German book that I absolutely adored as a child, um, and I've bought it for my son. Unfortunately, it's about that thick, um, and <laughs> and I've encouraged him to read it. And he's he's started now. It's it's old. It's I think it came out in 1953 or something like that. So it's mm -hmm. it's it's quite antiquated language by now. It's not an easy book. Um, but I think, yeah, we, we want our children to share. Here's the identity again. We want our mm -hmm. children to share that part of ourselves. Mm -hmm. And if they haven't got the language skills to do that, then there is almost, <coughs> excuse me, almost like a, I'm going to say like a grieving process, that this is one part that your child cannot, you know, one part of your life that your child can't be a part of mm -hmm. in the same way. And, and similarly, I think I've spoken to parents where the child, um, didn't enjoy the same book. They read it, but they went, actually, no, I didn't like that. And then, yeah. and then that was quite hard for the parent to take as well, because of course, yeah, um, yeah it's quite common actually that, that parents um, give their children the books that they read when they themselves were children, which by that yeah. point are obviously 20, 30 years, 40 years yeah. you know, out of date. <laughs> yes. um, and but it can be difficult for children who don't live in the country to access the the up to date the current books because the parents unless they have younger siblings or nieces or nephews or whatever they've not necessarily stayed on top so my mm -hmm. son um discovered I, I think the books that my son read were entirely dependent originally on what was available on audible because yeah. that's he he did that thing he did where he read the audiobook or he listened to the audiobook while reading um so whereas i you know i tried to share certain books with him and he was really into declined which wasn't around when i was when i was a child no. 
No, absolutely, yes. Uh, that that also because I mean, uh, uh, like you said, 20, 30, 40 years later, the books that children read in the different age groups are different mm -hmm. from when we grew up. But I, I would also reverse the whole thing and say, also our children can, uh, they have preferences for books and mm -hmm. then they share them with us and, and these become then part of our rivers of reading because, uh, yeah, even if we are maybe more than 40, 50 yeah. or whatever, we can put them on our river at that point when they are sharing them with us. So it's And a, I think it's a, that is, yeah, I think I that is magical. I When my son comes to me and says, I've read this, I think you would enjoy this. Yes. How a much lot. does that say about our understanding of each other, our mm -hmm. sense of identity, you know? Absolutely. I, I know what you would like. I know you. I think that, <laughs> that's an amazing level of, of, yes. yeah, of yeah. being with each other. Absolutely. I have a pile of books from my children. I, I cannot read as fast as that. I, I would need three heads and, and six eyes to do that. But it, I, I definitely love it because mm -hmm. it's, it's really reversing the role that uh, was before I would suggest them some readings. But now they are. Um, I wouldn't say that they suggest them to me. They say, Mom, read that. That's very interesting. You need to know that. <laughs> so, Not a suggestion. It's an order. <laughs> it's an order. Yes, it's, it's like my task, but but I love it. So, so thank you very much, uh, Sabine, for this very enriching uh, discussion or interview we had today about this uh, asynchronous uh, multiliteracy that can be synchronized to some extent thanks to some uh, exercises and things that we mentioned throughout the interview. Thank you very, very much for your time. Thank you so much for having me. Absolutely. Thank you so much for sharing your expertise and your, and your time. It's uh, we, every month, every month we do this, right? Everybody who's watching on uh, YouTube and, uh, and Facebook right now. Uh, and in fact, uh, recently, uh, Uta and I, we've actually started a, a new uh, activity on a weekly basis. Well, we're going to be right here on this platform uh, every week. Uh, Uta and I will sit down and we can talk about kind of everything and anything related to raising bilingual, multilingual kids. Uh, so every every week, uh, that's other than the third Tuesday, where we have experts come in, such as yourself, uh, Sabina, and uh, talk to us about the cutting edge science and the research uh, in this niche. Uh, the other weeks, well, Uta and I will be sitting here and uh, sort of sharing our thoughts on past interviews, on what we're doing in, in our daily lives, on on progress within this uh, this platform, uh, our our own platform, the Raising Multilinguals Live platform. So lots of things coming up uh, on a timely basis, I guess, and periodically. So I do hope uh, everybody will be. Uh, logging in, if you have some time, uh, listen to us uh, chat uh, while you wash the dishes and whatnot. <laughs> we'll be doing that uh, on a weekly basis. And next month, we do have another very, very special guest who has been with us previously. So we'll have Professor Anik de Howard uh, on the third week, third Tuesday of April. It so. will be. It will be a Wednesday. Oh, that's yeah, right. That's right. Just for this, this uh, specific. Just report. for this session. And, and it's my fault. I'm sorry. No. <laughs> I, have a, I have a conflict that day, so uh, it will be on a Wednesday for the next one. Yes. But still, it's a very, very interesting topic. Uh, something that we're all guilty of. I'm, I certainly was guilty of. And it's uh, the title is "Why is it a bad idea to constantly compare bilinguals to mon monolinguals?" Yes. <laughs> so, do tune in. In a month's time. Meanwhile, once again, thank you. Shout, shout out to everybody who's uh, tuned in today. Uh, this recording is obviously going to be on our platform, so you can watch the recordings and continue to write in questions for us and uh, for Sabina. And if we have anything we need to direct to Sabina, we will do that. So thank you so much. And we will be seeing everybody next week. Thank you. Last comment from Jenny. Thank you. Jenny, I know Jenny. Hi, Jenny. Right. <laughs> there you go. Great way to end this. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Perfect. Bye bye. Bye. Alla prossima. Ciao.